The Tom Woods Show, episode 1323. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Tell me if this sounds like you. You're debating health care with your interventionist friends, and you just can't seem to hold your own. They immediately claim the moral high ground, and you just don't know how to respond. Well, check out my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Healthcare, and you will be shocked. Yes, even you, a veteran libertarian, will be shocked at just how solid the libertarian position is. Pick it up for free at yourfriendsarewrong.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Today, we're talking about agorism. Many of you folks already know what this is, but some of you newbies will not know. And that's why we've got this episode. But we're talking about this set of ideas, and in particular about Sam Konkin, the man who, well, really came up with these ideas. He was the one who presented them as a system and who's associated with them. And it turns out that years after his death, we are finally seeing the release of at least a portion of what he intended to be, in effect, his magnum opus, the book Counter Economics, From the Back Alleys to the Stars. And I thought that was an opportune moment to talk about this subject and this man. And we're talking about it with Victor Coleman, who is a three-time Prometheus Award-winning science fiction author, as well as a longtime libertarian publisher who knew Sam Konkin very well and is himself an exponent of his ideas. So, Victor, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, Sam Konkin and his ideas and this— uh, Counter economics book that you know we have portions of, but that uh, was intended to be in effect a magnum opus. Can we start before we get into the details of that book specifically? Start with who he was. Well, uh, Sam was a uh, Canadian from Edmonton, uh, Alberta, and born in 1947. He uh, studied at the University of Alberta, got his uh, Bachelor of Science with honors and then went to the University of Wisconsin for a couple of years. But his uh, most important time was spent at New York University, where he met Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises and uh, others that uh, sort of propelled his libertarian awareness, even though he was... uh, He started out as a social creditor, which is a Canadian party, and uh, moved on to libertarianism, and then to invent his own expansion of libertarianism called agorism, from which counter-economics stems. All right, so let's talk about then um, agorism. I don't think I've talked about it much on the show, but I did play an interview I did on, of all things, Fox News Radio, where I shocked the hosts by mentioning it, talking about it. And I felt so subversive because I thought (laughs) this Fox News audience has no idea what they're in for with this. But I thought, what the heck, right? I mean, what's the point of being on the radio if you're just going to repeat talking points? So I I did that. But explain what it is because I think a lot of people – one of the interesting points that Sam makes is that a lot of people are already kind of living it, at least in some aspects of their lives. Right. His theory was that government – any government, so intrudes on our lives that it's almost impossible to conduct human action, von Mises' term, uh, without violating some law or another. His favorite was, if you charge the same price as everybody else, you're guilty of collusion. If you charge uh, more than somebody else, you're you're guilty of uh, uh, monopolistic practices, if you charge less than somebody else, you're, uh, you're, you're basically undercutting the market and uh, engaging in harmful activities. So he liked to say, and I'm sure other people have said this, that he you know, breaks three laws before breakfast. So his theory was that people act, and when they act in their own enlightened self-interest, they have to act in violation of the government, which seeks to control your actions and uh, basically suck out your uh, essence, you know, either money or will or uh, psychological well-being. He was a great believer in psychic profit as opposed to a monetary profit. Uh, he supported both, but he, when people asked him, you know, why aren't you doing something that'll make you rich? Uh, he said he gets much more uh, psychic profit from his activism. 
So he looked at the world and said, there are two ways we can interact with each other, coercively and non-coercively. Coercively is the nature of the state and non-coercively is the marketplace and never the twain shall meet. So therefore, what was his view then of politics? Oh, he was, he was against it. He, he opposed the Libertarian Party. He was one of the first people to write in opposition to the, the concept of a Libertarian Party. He said, how can you say we believe in human freedom and human action and uh, rights and all that, uh, so please put us in charge of your life and your rights and your freedom? Uh, he, he was a long time. In fact, uh, one of the most famous exchanges was between Sam and um, Dave Nolan of the one of the founders of the LP. Uh, so the Nolan Konkin letters were in a, a early issues of uh, New Libertarian and uh, maybe Reason, I'm not sure. I'd have to look back on that. I've got a uh, Excel spreadsheet of all of his publications and all of his appearances in other publications, and uh, it's it's pretty extensive. He was he was a very prolific writer. All right, so politics is out for that reason, but that does not mean by any means, that therefore we have no recourse. We have, there are other things we can do in the here and now rather than just theorize about a free society someday. There are steps we can take in the immediate run. Now, what do those look like? Well, one of his uh, theories was that most people, as you said, are acting counter-economically even though they don't know it. Now, he coined the term counter-economics in the same sense of counter-culture as being an alternate underground culture that opposed the current culture, at least back in the 60s. And counter-economics is economics that is outside of the realm of government economics or uh, the economics of the court economists. So when you, let's, uh, as an example, when you don't uh, report all of your income on your taxes because you did some cash work, well, you're behaving counter-economically. Now, you think you're just trying to save a few dollars, but you're also subconsciously opposing the state and the state's restrictions on you and the state's uh, fingers in your wallet. So the book Counter-Economics uh, goes into a number of things, and the very th first thing he starts with is tax counter-economics. That's chapter one. And then he goes on to counter-economics in other countries. And of course, since he wrote this in the early 1980s, one of his favorite examples of how counter-economics can't be crushed by even the most powerful of states, he has a chapter devoted to Soviet counter-economics and how even in the Soviet Union, in order to get things done, the commissars or at least the lower level apparatchiks had to resort to counter-economics, buying things on the black market, giving higher wages to people and just reporting lower wages uh, just, just to motivate people and get things done. One of the greatest demotivators in the world is government. And that leads to economic collapse, but it collapses not because the government can't do anything at all, even though that was his theory, but because people will act in defiance of the government without even thinking that they're defying the government. They're just trying to get something done, and they think the laws against getting something done are stupid. And that's how counter-economics can collapse entire government economy. Right, right, right. In fact, in that chapter, he says something like, the more the government is involved in the economy, the larger becomes the counter economy. Right. He was a big fan of Star Wars. And of course, one of his favorite lines from Star Wars is, you know, you know the more you tighten your grip, the more worlds will slip through your fingers. And that's counter economics at its very essence. The more a state cracks down on human activity, the greater the counter-economy grows. So you could conceivably have a very laissez-faire government where there's practically no counter-economy because nothing is really illegal or controlled by the state. Well, let me give a couple of just simple, basic, mundane examples of ways in which even your next-door neighbor m might be participating in the counter-economy without realizing it. For example, if you have a yard sale, I mean, now, I don't have yard sales, so if the IRS is listening, I, I don't bother because I don't have them. But if, if you do, are you really paying taxes on the money you're making on that yard sale? I, I find that highly unlikely, right? That's <laughs> – or, or uh, the the uh, bottles you recycle, right. or the, <laughs> right. uh, the 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 yes, all, all those things people don't report, even though they're you know legally obligated to. Uh, lottery winnings, lottery winnings is a big one. Anything under a few hundred bucks doesn't really get reported. 
you go to the store, you turn in your lottery ticket, and you get your money. So uh, all of those are yeah. Or, or for example, if if like me, you have a radar detector. <laughs> well, what is the point of a radar detector if not to evade the state, right? And and I did it specifically for that reason. I I've been pulled over for some dumb reason, and I just said to myself, that is it. I am never giving these people one more dime. And sitting there, I ordered it right on my phone before I even started driving. <laughs> yeah, that is it. So in other words, we all do this to some degree. But I guess for me, what I find a little bit scary about counter-economics is – I mean, maybe I don't fully understand what he's driving at, but the, I, I mean, I guess there's got to be some extent to which you have to use prudence here. I mean, unless you want everybody to wind up in prison, you have to figure out where the possibilities for building or operating within the counter economy are. Sam's goal was to increase self-awareness in people, to realize that counter economics and the black market, the underground economy, whatever you want to call it, the counter economy, as he called it, is not something that's far off and distant and, you know, run by guys in, in overcoats and slouch hats, that the counter economy is something we live every day. And uh, if he could make people aware of that, he could build a counterculture of counter economists in which people mutually support one another. They don't turn in, you know, they don't they don't see a, a lemonade stand and call the uh, the health department and say, I don't think these kids have a permit. Come on and crack down on them. He was very against, uh, you know, counter economic snitches. He believed that if he could create this uh, awareness where people consciously are acting counter-economically and consciously calculate the risk versus reward of in acting counter-economically, that he could build the counter-economy and build a, a uh, agorist movement that could uh, basically replace the state. Now, he, he had some critics uh, on at least – I mean the general idea, you know, if you agree with us that there's a – serious moral problem with the state, then the general idea should be totally unobjectable. It would only be the practicality of it. And so Rothbard, for example, said, I could see how you could apply this in some cases, but I don't see how you could have a counter economy, let's say for heavy industry that has to be largely visible and, and above board and everybody would know that it's there. How does he respond to things like that? Well, he says there's really no size. He, he states that Giant industries right now are behaving counter-economically, whether it's the oil industry changing uh, uh, shipping manifests to say they're shipping to one place, but it actually goes someplace else and just the paperwork has, has made the moves. And even now it's even more easy with electronics. The paper doesn't even have to move, just the digits move. Uh, he inspired my novel, Kings of the High Frontier, and in one of the sequences, I have a character who owns a gun manufacturing company, and by day, they manufacture guns with serial numbers and everything like that, and uh, the midnight shift is run with a skeleton crew or even robotically, uh, where guns without serial numbers are made and sold to um, individuals who, you know, families in the barrio that need to protect themselves, groups in Somalia that are opposing the, uh, the gangs that are running around there. So uh, there are many ways in which uh, they could operate counter-economically, and a lot of them do on an international scale, you know, between governments. There's a lot of, he, he always said that there, anarchy exists between governments, because there's no super government, despite the existence of the UN, is it, that is not a world government. And therefore, countries have to behave, nations have to behave amongst one another as if they're already in an anarchy with no law governing their actions. Right. Uh, which some countries ignore at will and other countries go along with. And uh, he views that as a, as a sort of uh, corrupt form of the mutual cooperation that comes with living in an anarchy. Let me uh, give one more example of something that I think will help people see that this is not as, I don't want to say far out as they might think, and that is the homeschooling movement because that's now more or less mainstream. And that just began with people saying, we're going to do this. And there were all kinds of obstacles thrown in the faces of these people. But when you got to a point where the sheer numbers would have made it impossible to suppress it, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, they could have rolled the tanks in and murdered everybody, but the point is they nobody has the political capital to get away with that. 
it just eventually became a sphere of life that civil society had carved out for itself against the state. It happened. I mean, that actually happened. And then, then it's no longer part of the counter economy, really. It just becomes part of, part of ordinary life. So do you think that's a good example? Sure. And in fact, he was a lifelong supporter of homeschooling and keeping kids out of uh, government indoctrination camps. So that fit in very well with, with his philosophy. And the whole idea of counter-economics was to become so accepted and so understood. Being understood is the most important part, uh, that it becomes accepted and becomes the economy. One of his chapters is, why isn't the counter economy, the economy, one of his unwritten chapters. And he explains that, that it's mostly self awareness. People aren't aware that they're behaving counter economically. I'd like you to take a minute to tell me a little bit about the history of this book specifically, Counter Economics, and uh, you know, how it fits into Sam's life, because I don't know the actual history of how it. I mean, I know that this was going to be his magnum opus, but apparently it was recently rediscovered? I mean, did somebody literally find it under something? What's the story there? <laughs> okay. Uh, originally, now, now he had already written a couple of books. One was called New Libertarian Manifesto, which in fact, Murray Rothbard uh, and uh, uh, Robert Lefebvre and um, um, Erwin Strauss, otherwise known as Filthy Pierre, wrote rebuttals to, and he then wrote rebuttals to the rebuttals, and they're all in the uh, 25th anniversary edition. Uh, he wrote that and self-published it in 1980, along with the rebuttals in something called uh, Strategy of the New Libertarian Alliance. And I collected all of those in 2005 and, and republished it in a paperback edition. So he wrote New Libertarian Manifesto, and that got circulated and read and reviewed and so on. He also wrote something called An Agorist Primer, which was going to be an introduction to agorism or agorism. I think he preferred accent on the gore. So he said agorism. I just think agorism rolls off the tongue better. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, he, he wasn't infallible. <laughs> uh, well, when it comes to English, being Canadian, he was. He put his you in labor and humor and uh, ah, okay. stuff like that. Yeah. But so he, he wrote those books. And of course, he had New Libertarian uh, in all its incarnations, New Libertarian Weekly, New Libertarian, the magazine, um, and so on. So he was, he was very well known in the movement. The Agorist Primer, he, try, he started the Agorist Institute and tried to make that the interface. It had a, some success. They published one issue of the Agorist Quarterly, which was um, supposed to be the uh, scholarly arm of the libertarian movement. So he started working on what he intended to be a mainstream book called Counter-Economics. And the original idea, he was there with another author. I won't name him because he didn't get around to finishing anything, but they were going to alternate chapters. He would do theory, and uh, this other author would do examples in the popular culture. And the idea there was that it would be uh, not too deep, very easy introduction to counter-economics, but it would be comprehensive. So he wrote six chapters and an outline and uh, circulated it. And he was fond of saying the feedback that he got was most pleasing. Uh, one of them, in fact, called it the the worst example of uh, libertarian uh, excess, something like that. And he, he took that as a note of pride. But it circulated to major publishers, and there was uh, very little interest. So he shelved it and went on to uh, the other things he was doing. He gave me the manuscript, the TypeScript manuscript of counter-economics and said, see if you can do something with it. Uh, I held on to it for years, intending to, uh, when he passed away, uh, I intended to finish it. He, he died in 2004, so I intended to write out the rest of the chapters since I was a writer and had, had uh, three Prometheus Award-winning novels. I figured I could also handle his voice and his uh, concepts, but I never got around to it. So a couple of years ago, I guess, la yeah, I guess it was last year, uh, Jane Neal Shulman approached me and said, you know, you've got Sam's manuscript, do something with it. 
uh, you know, he was also inspired by Sam. His novel and movie, Alongside Night, uh, are, are the best distillation of counter-economics, according to Sam, that uh, in, in fictional form. So I had the manuscript. I had scanned it in. And over the years, I was cleaning up the scan and, uh, you know, correcting any errors that resulted from a very primitive scan back in the uh, 90s. And I started looking through his emails because I, I sort of in, inherited all of his files and uh, some of his disks. And I found a mention years ago of him writing to someone who wanted to put counter economics online. And he said, uh, sure, you know, uh, Victor gave me a, a copy of the scan. Let me see if I can find it. But I, I, Victor, could not find anything in that email chain that said he delivered them. And obviously the book wasn't online. So, but it let me know that his wishes weren't that the book be finished uh, or, or rather withheld until it's finished, that it be made available. So chastened, I uh, created a, an EPUB version of the book, including the outline of the missing chapters and put that online. Now there were allegedly four more chapters, chapters uh, seven through 10, that would have completed everything that he had on the book, but I can't find it. I have two of his laptops. I have uh, a, a Jasmine drive that is no longer readable. I have a uh, Bernoulli drive that I went through, actually connected it to one of the laptops, checked everything on there for anything that could be the chapters, and uh, you know could find nothing. So uh, I don't know where they are. Uh, Neil says that he may have them uh, electronic versions. I can't believe that Sam wouldn't have made you know multiple copies but uh th those are temporarily lost but if we find them i will add them to the book and you know new versions of the book are will be available on smashwords if it came about to that and whoever bought the book can download the latest version i think that's how it works um so he didn't finish it and uh, he died <laughs> so uh what exists i i think that if anyone wanted to use his outline as a guide, each each chapter could be a book in itself yeah. you know, with, with a proper counter-economic um, outlook. So, you know, you've got the, 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 the lost chapters were uh, smuggling counter-economics. He was a big fan of smuggling. Um, transportation counter-economics, such as Citizen Band. You mentioned radar. Uh, you know, I've known Sam since 1975, and one of our favorite songs between the Anarcho Village crowd uh, was um, Convoy. <laughs> you know, so we would uh, go around singing Convoy as we were going to science fiction conventions and stuff. So he, you know, and, and each chapter had subheadings like moving people counter economically, air counter economics, space counter economics. Um, Energy counter-economics was another chapter, and human counter-economics. So those are the chapters that may exist. And the unwritten chapters are dissenters and intellectual counter-economics, sex counter-economics, uh, feminist counter-economics. Now, it's interesting that he covered the home birth movement as uh, when it was still illegal. And now, of course, it's, it's the normal thing. So this is one another example of the counter-economy just causing the state to throw up its hands and say, okay, whatever, you know? So now home birth, I don't think it's illegal anywhere. And it's a, uh, it's a common thing. So he would have scored that as a uh, win uh, if he, you know, lived to see that become almost the norm rather than the exception. Justice counter economics, one of the most, one of the biggest objections to agorism and counter economics is the the problem of justice. He had to deal with it many times. And so this would have been his his uh, chapter on justice counter economics. Uh, he believed in insurance and arbitration, and also in a sort of a free market uh, counter economic uh, recovery team. <laughs> that if somebody steals from you, you have the right to get that property restored plus. Uh, time use lost, which is uh, like an originary rate of interest uh, on the lost value, uh, the time lost value, 
but he didn't believe in punishment. He didn't believe if somebody steals your car that you can go steal your car back and then blow up that guy's car or something. He didn't believe in anything beyond actual restitution and time loss. So he called it natural law enforcement, believed in arbitration and so on. Uh, psychology counter-economics was another one. He was not a fan of psychology, uh, but he understood that people have psychological uh, issues that need to be addressed. And one of the way, ways of addressing them was this book. Why should you feel guilty for you know, in, indulging in the black market or engaging in a counter-economic action? He believed that mutual reinforcement was the best way to counter authoritarianism. And finally, the last part of his book would have been a couple of chapters of, of real theory. Like he would explain praxeology, which is the study of human action, uh, von Mises. says. He'd explain the capital pyramid of Eugen Bawerk and uh, so on. Explain why counter-economics works, how it works, and then uh, opposition or, or people who oppose counter-economics. Uh, he wanted to deal with any objections to it or dead ends. And this was his list of dead ends. Conservatism, liberalism, socialism, anarchism, varieties of libertarianism, pacifism, dropping out, and retreatism will all be trotted out, defined, sketched, and refuted as means of achieving a free society. Again, drawing heavily on the reader's experience of the rest of the book to keep it short and sweet or quick and deadly. Once all the other options are eliminated, that will leave the final chapter, social counter-economics, which is the idea of building a mutually reinforcing uh, society of people who understand why they need to act in opposition to the state uh, or in total ignorance or defiance of the state and, and why that's a good thing, not to feel guilty about it. I want to ask you a couple of really practical questions that probably would occur to people. First one that occurs to me is, presumably, if I'm part of the counter-economy, I don't want to unnecessarily call attention to myself. I don't want to invite trouble for no good reason. But then in that case, how do I draw more people in if I have to kind of keep my, my head down? Well, this is where he would have loved the current state of uh, encryption and targeted marketing. Because in the past, yes, advertising sort of, you know, if you were, if you were dealing drugs, you couldn't take out an ad in you know, the paper and say, come and get your pot here. So most advertising is word of mouth. He strongly believed in word of mouth. But now in the age of the dark web and uh, encryption, you can market your products specifically to people who are either A, uh, interested or B, vetted by whatever system allows people onto that particular network. So you can advertise and build a group around you that is both mutually supportive and mutually protective. They won't rat you out. You won't rat them out. And uh, if anybody infiltrates, infiltrators can be pushed out as soon as they're discovered. And there comes a point, his theory, that when the counter economy becomes so big that it is bringing in more money than the state and the state is starved for funds, that the state just relents and uh, shrinks or goes away. Or the most likely that we're probably seeing right now is a violent death throes where statists are thrashing all about and uh, attacking everything in sight. And as we've seen on the left, starts attacking itself because it has nothing left to attack uh, but deviationists. All right. And then I guess lastly, the most fund raw fundamental question of them all, which is, I don't want to go to prison. How do I do this without going to prison? Well, again, how many people are going to prison right now for violating the federal uh, laws against uh, marijuana? The counter economy became so big, so many people smoked marijuana or tried marijuana, and whether they liked it or didn't like it, they didn't think it was that big a deal, that this counterculture plus a counter economy of of people that didn't think the government should be involved in, in pot criminalization uh, eventually resulted in some states, such as California and Colorado, relenting. Some uh, federal agencies, such as uh, 
you know, the Justice Department under Obama said, oh, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to enforce that. You know, we're not going to bother uh, that eventually there is no risk. Uh, so the idea is to grow the counter economy, increase self-awareness until such point that the government can't send everybody to jail. And, and right now, with tax evasion, uh, that, that seems to be pretty common. They only prosecute a few high-value, high-profile uh, people like Wesley Snipes and hope that that keeps everybody else in line and fearful. But the odds of getting caught for any crime are about 10%. I mean, by the government's own statistics, which Sam quotes in the book, he always believed in, in conducting a risk versus reward analysis of each action that you intend to take that you know is illegal, but is actually not immoral. He was a strong moralist, so he believed that agorism is the moral option to statism or authoritarianism. Well, it's interesting that these days, uh, like if I talk to a lot of young libertarians, Sam's name doesn't come up that much. Uh, you know, they they tend to be more plugged into maybe more mainstream voices. And yet it's to the young people that I look for refreshing radicalism. So, uh, you know, maybe some of them will listen in and be exposed to something new and different, you know, because doggone it, we could at the very least stand to have a multiplicity of strategies operating side by side and, and see which one wins, certainly. But certainly, I would like to see people check out what Sam uh, wrote, and in particular, this work, Counter Economics. I'm going to link to it on uh, the show notes page. This is episode 1323, so it'll be tomwoods.com, so it's 1323. The book is Counter Economics from the Back Alleys to the Stars. Victor, any final words before we depart? Well, he would have loved the number 1323 because he was a Discordian and a big fan of Robert Anton Wilson on Robert Shea's Illuminatus. Uh, and uh, second, did we say his actual full name, Samuel Edward Konkin III? We did not. <laughs> Samuel Edward Konkin III, my dear friend Sam, or Sec3, S-E-K-3, as he was uh, also known. So if you just uh, type in the word agorism in uh, Google, they haven't blocked it yet, you'll you'll find all sorts of young people doing stuff about agorism. Okay. Some, of them crediting, some of them crediting Sam and some not. You know, some, some don't even know. It's just a great word and a great concept, and that's how ideas permeate into the zeitgeist. Well, that really is. When, when you're actually pursuing an idea and you have no idea where it came from, then it really has permeated. It's, yep. it's, in a way, it's almost better that they don't know because it means that uh, we've gotten past just the personality aspect of it and we've, we've got right, right to the idea. Well, I've, I've really appreciated uh, your time and, and a very interesting conversation. So uh, again, tomwoods.com slash 1323 is the quickest way to find a link to pick up that book. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right, folks, couple things. I was a day behind this week. You know, happens to everybody. But I'm still getting that fifth episode out to you. It's just going to come out over the weekend. So watch for episode 1,324 coming over the weekend. Second thing, I have a site I'd like to tell you about. And this is thirdcoasthealth.com. This is a, the people who run it are Tom Wood Show listeners. And they say that anybody who wants to naturally combat stress, anxiety, pain, post-workout soreness, and more will benefit from CBD, including pets. ThirdCoastHealth.com offers a variety of high-quality lab-tested CBD, TH-free products. Featured in publications like JujitsuTimes.com, ThirdCoastHealth.com takes the stress out of buying CBD with outstanding customer support. And guess what, folks? Visit ThirdCoastHealth.com today to save 10% using, well, come on, guess. Take a wild guess. Promo code WOODS at checkout. So I'm going to link to them at TomWoods.com slash 1323 as the listener website mentioned for today. And remember, you can get nice publicity like this for your website. Just make sure and go ahead and get your hosting through my link when you start your site. And um, you'll find all the instructions at tomwoods.com slash publicity. You get some great bonuses that'll really get you off to a good start. And what was the third thing I was going to say? Um, oh, okay. Well, let me just tell you this. <laughs> let me just tell you this. Episode 1325, which is being released uh, Monday, January 21st, that's one of my favorite episodes in recent memory. I brought our old friend, the historian Brian McClanahan, back on. We 
took apart an article that we found online together, and we just laughed and had a great old time through the whole thing, and I think you're going to get a lot out of that one. I am so, so pleased with that. So uh, anyway, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe to The Tom Woods Show for free, of course, over at tomwoods.com slash iTunes. See you soon. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.